Welcome to Obey Your Strengths with Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, Kathy Kirsten. Our guest today is Tom Hatton. Tom is the CEO and president of the MSR Group, a marketing research company based in Omaha, Nebraska. Tom is an expert in talent development and has been sought after for talent and organizational excellence roles, both in the U.S. and the Middle East. Tom has spent more than three decades with the Gallup organization, and in his role as senior principal, he he led teams of global consultants and researchers on both the customer and employee management side. Tom is a master at using a strength-based approach to selecting and developing employees. Tom, thanks so much for joining us today on Obey Your Strengths. Kathy, thanks for uh, allowing me the opportunity. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. I can't wait for the listeners and myself to download some of your strengths wisdom. You really spent three decades at the Gallup organization. You were there before the first StrengthsFinder book was published. Don Clifton, whose name is attached to StrengthsFinder, the father and grandfather of positive psychology and really the guru of of strengths-based research, uh, said once that a, a good idea is worth pursuing for a lifetime. So I didn't quite make it that far, but I made the first three decades of my career uh, really around that idea that, you know, people focusing on what's right with them versus what's wrong with them is really, really a great thing to do. Well, I can't wait to hear more. But before we begin, I want to hear about your top five strengths. And if you don't mind, take a moment on each strength to tell us a little bit about how it manifests itself. Well, Happy to do that. Uh, My top five strengths are command, self-assurance, activator, ideation, and strategic. You have three in the influencing domain in your top five. Yes. Wow. It's funny because you you don't know this when you're a little kid or even when you're a, a teenager or whatever, but you, especially in my shoes, can look back and evaluate that, wow, that's why... I was always the captain at recess, you know, choosing the team. That's why I was always pushing myself to the front of the class and, you know, being, you know, trying to be a leader and, you know, just really forcing myself into the equation when other people wouldn't. I, I was kind of known as fearless and, you know, that's really the command early, early and often in my life. And that's, that's always been true for me. I've met leaders that lack that, but it does seem to be maybe a little more prevalent in people that have ascended to leadership positions because they don't mind and, in fact, they need to be in charge. So for me, um, that one is, is very, very much I own that one. Uh, the next one on my list being self-assurance, there's an old running joke, and it really fits me quite well, that I may be wrong, but I'll never be in doubt. I I guess, as with all strengths, you know, when you look at it through a positive lens, self-assurance looks like confidence and uh, very assured, you know, in everything you pursue and just not really much doubt, you know, done, you know, maybe done poorly or, or looked at differently, it can come off as maybe cocky or arrogant or whatever, you know, so for me, it's always been important to back up that assurance with facts, data. So that's the the self-assurance. For my next one, Activator, um, you know, this one, I'll I'll do a little curveball maybe with this one because I can tie it to some things that are way lower on my list as well. I'm probably a better get things started guy than I am a finish them up guy uh, because those things are, are lower on my list. So I can drive change, I can drive initiatives and get them off the ground, but partway through, I kind of lose interest a little bit in taking them out, you know, so many places past the decimal point. Uh, I just, I'd rather start something new. I'd rather, you know, kind of be pushing, pushing, pushing. So that's, that's the activator in me. For my next one, ideation, I'm just somebody you can combine that with another one of my strengths called input that's a little little lower down the list where I'm just always looking for the next big idea. Uh, taking in all the data and information and reading and science and research that I possibly can 
and saying, you know, how does that affect my life? What does the future look like? How can those ideas translate into, you know, kind of the next thing for me, for the people I know, the people I consult with, for the companies I lead? And those those things just come naturally to me. And then there's an, uh, certainly an element of congruence with the next one, what I just said to the, the fifth one on my list being strategic. Just all those what if questions. If we did this, what would that look like? Uh, if we take this twist and turn versus this one, what are the direct consequences, but maybe the unintended consequences? And really playing out all those different scenarios, inviting opinions, sorting through all the muck, and finding a clear path forward where there might be a lot of obfuscation or uncertainty. I can find that because I've played it out in my head. I've predicted the future. And, you know, frankly, because it's a strength, I'm really not wrong that often in terms of what I see coming to fruition. So there you go. That's my, that's my what top five. excellent articulation of your top five. Is your current role utilizing these? I imagine it is as the CEO and president of the MS our group that you not only see the picture ideation strategic and how to get there, right? Like thinking of those ideas, but then moving people towards a better future. Yeah, it, it really does. It's, it's funny. I I've joked since I got here that, you know, my whole life has been preparing me for this particular role. One it's as the, the leader of the company as president and CEO. Uh, this is my first time being in that role. I was, you know, very near the top in, you know, global conglomerates of huge scale and size. So, you know, it almost could be argued that those were bigger jobs, but I wasn't ultimately in charge. So that part of it suits me really well. It suits me to take a very successful 60 year old company that kind of in its current form is about 25 years old and is very well regarded and very successful, but to take it by the shoulders and shake it really hard and look at doing things new and different and better and, you know, all those what ifs, but more than any of that, uh, coming to a place where uh, they, they probably hadn't focused on the thing that I put first on the list every day, which is making sure everybody's as talented as they can possibly be in their role and for the assignments that they're given, what they're asked to do and what those expectations are. This company probably hadn't heretofore really done that. So that's been a, a really a major phase shift. And I'm, I'm hitting about the one year mark in the company. And it takes a while to get that right. You know, when you kind of start in a place where you haven't been doing that much, it doesn't happen overnight. And in a very deliberate way, I've been able to do that. It's taken about a year. But we not only, you know, built the right boat, we've got the right people on the boat. And it's really, really starting to come together. Our best months since I've been here have been the last two consecutively, and they look better and better every month, you know, from here through the rest of the year. Tom, tell us what it was like working at Gallup um, in the early Strengths Finder days. Did you know at the time that you were working on a big idea that may change the course of human development? Well, Kathy, I, I mentioned earlier here in our time together that Don Clifton believed that a good idea was worth pursuing for a lifetime. And I don't know if it was a particular prescience on my part or dumb luck or just being around really talented people, but I actually did know that. I mean, even at a young age, I, you know, it's a funny story really how I met Don. I was friends with his youngest daughter and we used to, you know, we're little teenagers. We're like 12 and 13 year olds hanging out at their house and, you know, sitting around in the basement, you know, just like kids do, you know. And I met Don when I was 12 or 13 and went to work for him when I was 15. Um, he was literally like a Pied Piper. You know, when, when he talked, people listened and you just wanted to follow and you believed in what he was saying and you didn't doubt his intention or his message or his science even one little bit. And you have to kind of recall, you know, this is interesting that we're having this talk now and focusing on what's right with people and their strengths doesn't seem like such a radical idea in 2000, you know, in the, in the 2000s, in 2018. Back in the 70s and 80s, 
it wasn't mainstream to talk that way. It was what's wrong with you? How can we fix it? Remediation, you know, all those things. But Don was on to it. And once you were just around it for a minute, you knew it was right. And so pursuing that at an early age meant that I changed my plans and, and then declined my acceptance to medical school. It meant that, you know, a, again, kind of along the lines of maybe dumb luck or some kind of unknown prescience, it was that I now can look back and think that, you know, being a medical doctor had a lot to do with pathology. What's wrong with people? They're sick, they're broken, fixing them that way. That really isn't Tom. What is for me is working with people at their best, on their best, every single day. That's way more exciting to me. I probably just fell into it back then, but it's been the, the best sort of U-turn choice in my life that I could have ever made. Wow. What a great story. I love that. Tom, you have built your career around getting the best out of people. And I met you in uh, my own interview process at, while you were serving as the VP of Talent Development Organizational Excellence at Rackspace. And I recall in our first meeting, you interviewed me for a role on the employee engagement team. Gosh, that was probably back in 2008. <laughs> it feels like it was. Yes, it was. Ten, it was 10 years ago. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I remember it was very engaging to be interviewed by you for the role I was interviewing in. And then you sent me the most incredible note after our interview. And I never had a chance to tell you that that meant so much to me. I actually forwarded that email on to my mom and dad. I don't know if that <laughs> if that touches your heart, but that's that's something that really like made an impression about how you saw my strengths playing on the team. And that was really, really cool. So I just wanted to give you a quick well, thank you. What, what heart I do have, because I have kind of low empathy, you've touched it. So I went all the way down to number 34 yeah, to touch your empathy. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> right. But thank you. That's that's very high praise. And I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, one of the things that comes up with the executives that I work with, many of the executives that I work with share a common leadership challenge, and that is finding and selecting the right talent for their team. And like I've said, you are a master at doing that. I know that you did that at Gallup and that you did that as well in, in other consulting or internally in other roles that you've played in some of America's top companies. So I would love for you to give us some insight. How do you, in such a short amount of time, in the course of an interview process, how are you able to decipher talents and skills for a candidate that's moving into a, a leadership role? What I really hope you would do for us, Tom, is just pull back that curtain a bit and help us understand your process. Kathy, uh, I'll happily do that. Uh, you've asked the question through the leadership lens. And so, you know, by definition, then you might be talking about helping a company select a new CEO or, you know, strategic operational leaders or people that really carry significance in terms of running companies. I'm going to actually take some liberty here and, and peel it back even further and just talk generally, like when I spoke with you earlier in your career, just a few things that, that I would just pretty openly say are almost universal truths. And I'll start with most people just do it wrong. I mean, I'll just be so bold as to say there, there just aren't that many good interviewers out there. And I say that even in the face of a lot of them having gone through, quote, behavioral interview training or whatever process their company uses or whatever. Uh, I've just rarely met uh, a whole lot of really very good interviewers. And uh, just a few very personal examples. Like if I sit down to interview someone, and I'll say this is very atypical, when I sit there and talk to them, I don't have their resume in front of me. I don't want to go line by line and pick apart like everything they've done that way. That's about the least interesting thing I think I can learn about somebody in 30, 45 or 60 minutes. Like I really don't need them to detail, you know, the years they were in school and this and this and this and line item by line item what their jobs were. I assume the people that were part of the process have sort of vetted that you know, closely enough to where that part of it's taken care of. And I know I only have so much time to really get to the essence of, of who that person is. It's, it's really quite, it's really just 
quite that simple. The, the magic really is asking good questions, but allowing the variance of the interview to exist across the table from me and not in my chair. And what that means to me is, and I think this is good practice, to ask the same questions of everybody and then let their responses introduce the variance. And it tells me that you're different than someone else and you're different than this guy over here. And, and to be able to, to really see those differences. So a couple examples would be, you know, one of, one of my favorite things that I've adopted now when I talk to somebody about a, you know, let's call it a production position. You know, it's kind of like there's three parts and I'm really oversimplifying here, but I can kind of look very simply at a project and say, you have this big project you're assigned and there's, you know, different phases of it. There's the, okay, I was given the project. Now I have to strategize about how we're going to go about it. Who's going to be involved? What are the timelines? And really think through that way. That's maybe the first part. The second option I'll give somebody is just getting going doing it, you know, just really getting after it, checking a lot of boxes on the list, uh, really making sure that things are running smoothly, optimizing performance, all that stuff. And then the third option is you finished it, done, put a line through it on your to-do list, move on to the next thing. Kathy, which one of those do you like best and why? Hmm, is there really a right answer to that question? Maybe not, but the answer you give to that question tells me really a whole lot about who you are and how you're wired. I mean, if you're if you're a pure achiever and that's number one on your list of top five, you might choose that third box. You might choose that the third choice I gave you and say, I finished it, line through it, moving on to the next one. If you're really a thinker and very strategic, you might choose the first one. Like, I want to plan it out and I want to find the efficiencies I want to do that. That tells me about you. So it's things like that to me that connote a really great, you know, way to pick questions that allow you to get to the essence of who somebody is, Uh, not questions that we think are good because it leads everybody to give the conventional answer, the expected answer, or all the same answer. Those are, those are not good. Now I'll transition maybe a little bit to your exact question about leaders. And I'll say, I've met leaders all over the world in the world's best companies and those that are less so, and nobody's ever the same. Uh, You know, you're you're really finding out um, how they're different and does that fit what we're really looking for? It's kind of like saying, you know, I've always looked at it like, you know, leadership talent being like a GPA of 3.5 or above. If you take all the students that got a 3.5 or above and say, those are great students, you take all the leaders that are X or Y or Z and above, and they're all great leaders, but everyone that got a 3.5 GPA didn't get their highest and lowest grades in all the same subjects. Like somebody over here got an, you know, an A plus in math, an A plus in, in science, but over here in the social sciences, they got a C minus, you know, whatever. Now, does that make them necessarily worse than somebody who aced psychology and aced sociology, but really is is not so great with numbers, so their math score is lower, but they're still a 3.5. So they're still called a good student. They still made the dean's list. And so the same is really true for me of of leaders and leadership. There's a lot of ways to do it right. There's a lot of ways to do it well. But every one of those ways doesn't fit a particular company, a culture, where they are. So you have to juxtapose the conditions. You know, some people really excel in tough markets. Some people really excel in hyper growth mode. Some people are really, really wired. And we worked with one of them together at Rackspace to be able to grow a little thing into a big thing fast. And that was Lanham Napier. What a great, you know, what a great story. But I actually advised Lanham that, you know, once we became what we were trying to become, that he might lose interest and not be, you know, wanting to be the CEO forever of that company. Lo and behold, he's done other great things after Rackspace, almost for that very fact. So hopefully that, that answers your, your question. A, a, a little long-winded, but, but hopefully that within there you can find some, some gold. 
I was just speaking with a leader on my drive over today around the conditions that exist in his small but growing organization. And I would love some of your thoughts. This is what you need to know about the leader is he is an activator. So you two share that strength together. And as he has built itself out, how he has built his team, he has found that he is having a hard time with uh, some talent that perhaps isn't as activated or achiever oriented. And, you know, as I think about that, I think what there's insight here to the culture of his organization and what's going to fit that model. What would you tell him, Tom? Well, my experience tells me, and, and this one's very personal to me because uh, growing up in Gallup, Jim Clifton, Don's son, our CEO, um, was very much an activator type. And we'd have a state of the company address every January or February at the start of the year. Th the great thing about that was sometimes one or two or three of those things that did come to fruition were such gold that if you would have just stayed the course and been very monolithic instead and stuck to what you're good at, you'd have never done them. That's how Gallup got into publishing. That's how Gallup has produced some of the greatest business books ever written and sold millions of copies of those books mm -hmm. because one of those state of the company addresses, Jim stood up and said, we're going to be in that business. And so my point of comparison is really, I also worked with some very successful leaders and very successful companies that were the opposite of that. They led by consensus. Everybody had to be on board with that, the, the idea that they were gonna implement. And instead of having 10 things this year that they talked about, it might have only been two, and they were so heavily vetted, they'd been working on them for five years before they even uttered a word about them. But the hit rate of the two they picked was like 100% because they were always going to get that right. So if you were the kind of leader that was, you know, I would say in that scenario that I just described, Jim would have been a bad fit for a company like that. You know, it just wouldn't have culturally fit you know, sort of the history of a company or what they're trying to do it would have been tremendous growing pains in any case to move them closer to how Jim operated and vice versa. If you were a, a very cautious, very consensus driven, sort of slow to make a decision kind of person in a heavily activated environment, you're just going to struggle with the pace, the pace of how fast change comes, the pace of the ideas and how quickly you can you know, take an idea and get it to market, let's say, uh, that's that's going to be a mismatch. And so I think that would be one place I'd start with your friend is, you know, just to be conscious of the, the talents that he's, he or she surrounds himself with to, you know, to make that happen. You know, let's talk about something controversial. Gallup says the strengths finder is not a selection tool, yet so many executives that I work with are tempted to use it. And number one, they're tempted to use it because it's accurate. They use it as a awareness tool for themselves and they can see how accurate it is, it, it is with their own strengths. But number two, it feels like it could be a fail-proof shortcut in the hiring process. You get some insight on what this candidate sitting in front of you responds to their world and, and, and how they see the world. So give us some insight because uh, you're the selection Jedi, <laughs> how can we use StrengthsFinder successfully in the hiring process? Yeah, I guess I'd give you a, a really a two-part answer to this question. One is, uh, I'm I'm obviously ex of Gallup now for about a decade, but I think I can still knowledgeably talk about because I was there, you, you know, for the whole time it was being developed as it was being propagated around the world, and I helped do all that. I believe it's a much more accurate statement to say that they chose not to use it as a selection tool because in its infancy, we actually did use it in many client circumstances as that, and it worked really, really well. It was sort of overlaying two different algorithms, uh, one, one sort of behind the curtain, behind the scenes that you didn't really see that could use Gallup's selection science using StrengthsFinder as the input, the algorithms behind the scenes based on top and bottom performance comparisons and correlations to outcomes, that you could get both the 
we recommend this person would be like an A versus a B versus a C choice for that job. But oh, by the way, also here are their top five strengths as the typical strengths finder would. It was a nice way to give a candidate output regardless of whether they were picked for the job or not. So I was always a proponent of that, that it could be both. Uh, I think Gallup made a marketing decision really versus a science decision to keep those things separate. And I can't really argue with the results because 19 million people have taken StrengthsFinder in one route and they've done really fine and well with their selection science in the other route. So uh, don't know how it would have would have gone otherwise. They've done quite well with it. I, I made the argument the other way and lost, but that's OK. I, I like that I you know stood up for the clients that used it and it really did work. So as it relates to how a person might actually use StrengthsFinder. Um, I think, again, it goes to just helping someone, a, a selection committee, or certainly the person making a significant hiring decision, know more faster about somebody than they ever could otherwise. The only sure way to really know someone and how they're going to perform in the job is to give them the job and see how they do. Short of that, it's it's all got a little bit of crystal ball, if not a lot of crystal ball built into it, which by definition means hopefully we're all better than the, you know, the the uh, psychic, you know, in in the mall that reads the the tea leaves and stuff. But it 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 really is forcing you to make some predictions about human behavior, and anyone that knows human behavior knows that people are messy and even someone you've known 20, 30, 50 years in your life will still surprise you. They'll still say something at a party or something where you'll say, that was so out of character. You've never done that before. The person you know best in the world still surprises you to this day because there's no perfect predictor of, of the messy science of human behavior. Companies like Gallup and others have really, really forwarded the science to where we can make very accurate and even valid predictions, just not perfect. So I'm just a fan of using StrengthsFinder as a, 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 a vehicle to get to the DNA of someone, you know, hopefully without any kind of confirmation bias, being able to use all those facts uh, in, in making better teams, better performance in teams, better delivery to customers, all those kinds of things that are attendant to great company performance. You know, you uh, mentioned a couple of books here, you, and what some of the information that you just spoke about on how to use strengths for selection and setting expectations and management and development of people. It, some of that is straight out of First Break All the Rules. And since you brought that, that book, since you brought that up early, it's one of my favorite management books. I believe in the early days at Rackspace, we used it as the management Bible. It was pretty much the only management training we had. Do you recall those? Right. <laughs> so First Break right. should be on your, your reading list if you want to understand how to use strengths or strength-based philosophy in managing others and managing yourself, uh, as well as, you know, you were there with the, with the Now Discover Your Strengths publication at Gallup too. I heard a rumor that you even contributed to some of the writing of that. Is that true? Yeah. I, you know, the old saying, success has many fathers, um, kind of a simple book, but you can look at each of the 34 themes in StrengthsFinder and see that there are basically on its on a page or, or in a, a, a short chapter about each of the 34, there are like 10 statements, which was frankly nothing more than Don bringing to bear all his extraordinary talent and great research from decades and packaging it in a way that was uh, user friendly and useful and had great output and great accuracy. So uh, really it was a, it was a joy to get to go and think about and talk about and write about those kind of things every day. And now I get to just live them out. So that's even better. <laughs> yeah, you get to do it from the, the top seat within your organization, which is really. really yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, Tom, 
This podcast, as you know, is called Obey Your Strengths, and it's mostly because we believe that strengths are deeply connected to why we do what we do and how we're fulfilled in not just our work, but in relationships and life. So can you tell me about an experience you had in which you were witness to the way that strengths were something to be obeyed versus just something to be played to? Oh, this is one um, for me. (laughs) That's a great question. I really appreciate you asking it that way. And really your delineation of those two words, you know, I can absolutely follow your thinking and why, why you take it in that direction. And as always happens, sometimes the best example you can give is the one you've lived through in your most personal example. So for me, I actually default on, on this question more to the personal life than the professional life. I shared earlier my, my top five um, themes of talent, command, self-assurance, activator. Uh, when, you, when you start with those things, one thing I learned about myself is, say, for instance, with my significant other, uh, which at the time was a spouse, um, you know, inevitably, when you're with someone for a long time, you're, you're going to have some sort of conflict, sometimes even an argument, perhaps. Because of my nature, as emotions and tensions rise, as things get um, a little more tense and filled with like all the things that go along with, with that. And so as those same tensions or emotions would rise in our you know, disagreement or, or heated discussion or whatever, she couldn't talk. She didn't know which words to use, kind of became more of a, you know, kind of a just full of emotion uh, kind of person. And I'm on the other side with just such great clarity. It, I, what I had to learn was that's an unfair fight. Like really, you just have to recognize that between those two things. And for me, that was learning how to manage through that was was obeying my own talent and honestly recognizing hers at the same time. Recognizing that she wasn't going to rise to the uh, level of emotion like I was, and that made it unfair. And that I had to temper my own behavior and obey exactly who I am because it would cause strife otherwise. I hope that answers your question, but that's very personal for me. I thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I have said many times, I I have coached others around the idea of getting into a fight with someone with with command or self-assurance gets you in a predicament. (laughs) (laughs) It sure can. Command has that way about it that creates clarity through polarization. And, uh, you know, wow, it is a unique strength. And I love the way you articulated it for us that with that rising emotion, you know the perfect word, you know the perfect way to win. Um, You know, that's the beauty and sometimes basement (laughs) of command. Well, Tom, I appreciate your time with us today. Is there anything else you would like to talk about or any last words? Kathy, this was just great. I enjoyed catching up with you. It's been too long. And I lo- obviously, I still have a passion for these topics, transcending my career in the company that helped you know, propagate them around the world. Like I said earlier, now I just get to live them out every day and use them in my leadership. Well, Tom, thank you so much for lending us your wisdom and Hopefully, I'll catch you on a future episode and you can talk about some of the changes you've driven within your organization from the same lens of strengths and and the things that you've done there there over the tenure of your career. But I love that you shared so many great stories with us and and gave our listeners so much uh, wisdom around how to select for talent. So thanks so much. All right. Take care. To learn more about Kathy Kirsten, visit her website, kathykirsten.com. That's K-A-T-H-Y-K-E-R-S-T-E-N.com. Obey Your Strengths is produced by Geekdom Media in association with Game Day Media Enterprises. Executive produced by Lorenzo Gomez, John Garcia, and Michael Largent.